Hello, everyone. Welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios Live Art Talk with visual artist Eve Gabriel. I'm Colette Mello. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, the City of Miami Beach, Department of Tourism, and Office of Cultural Affairs for their continued support. Eve Gabriel is a Haiti born artist based in South Florida. Eve's abstraction and conceptual works intersect with political activism and address issues of social justice, such as police brutality, the AIDS epidemic, and colonialism. He uses text, cardboard, coffee, and other repurposed materials as a means to confront societal ills and encourages viewers to have open, frank discussions about these inequities and disparities. His work, Haiti, Unity with Strength, was featured in the publication International Contemporary Masters 5, and then was exhibited at the Southern Nevada Museum of Art. In 2016, he collaborated with Yvette Michelle Booth and Prince Emmanuel Adderley on the Family Tree Project, which was part of the Saving Grace AIDS in the Black Community exhibition, which opened at the Old Dillard Museum and then traveled to the World's Aid Museum. In 2017, Yves Gabriel collaborated with Todd Schwing on the Public Arts Project, Unity Beacon, which is a sculpture located on 13th Street and Old Dixie Highway in Fort Lauderdale. In 2019, Eves was part of the group exhibition, New Industry, Contemporary Visions of the Industrial, Industrial at the Frank Gallery, and most recently had a solo exhibition at the Bailey Contemporary Art Center titled Shattered, which was curated by Juliana Ferrero. Eves Gabriel has an MFA in visual arts from Florida International University. Hi, Eve. Thanks you for joining us. Thank you. It's great to see you. I'm going to let you take it away. All right. Thank you for having me, Colette. Um, so let me just go ahead and uh, begin. So, so first, do you mind just sharing where you are and about and talk about um, the artwork behind you? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm at uh, my home uh, studio. Uh, this is, you know, where really my inspirations you know, come down to life. And uh, that piece here is a new piece that I that created a couple of months ago. And uh, this title, uh, Never uh, You Were a Slave. And instead of focusing on uh, the slavery, really, um, as the main, as the focal point, I, um, what I did, I uh, decided to really um, investigate all you know, the works in you know, African-Americans since you know, slavery, their contribution uh, to uh, this country. And uh, as their legacies you know, are passed on, and now we're seeing the progress you know, being made um, uh, despite you know, white supremacy or white nationalism. And, uh, and that's what this space is their journey throughout you know, uh, that in past. And now we're seeing the fruit of it, of that, their ancestry. That's what this piece is about. I'll let you go ahead and start your presentation. Okay. Um, while, you know, growing up in Haiti, I, um, you know, I was taught about colonialism, but I never knew or fully understood the extent of its impact, you know, on our culture until I uh, began to, uh, you know, to use my painting to investigate, you know, those issues. Um, that are still in really undermining the, uh, the societal fabric, you know, of, of our country. So uh, the next four pieces that we'll be sharing, they're from an ongoing series called Quick Crack. Is anyone listening? So uh, the first one is titled Hidden Misery. Let me just go ahead and I don't, I'm not sure whether or not, because it's asking me again what, if I want all participants to mm -hmm. share. No, because it's asking me who can start sharing with someone else is sharing. Only you? No, you should be able to share it with everyone. Diani, you can see it, right? Yeah, but it, somehow it's not, it's not allowing me to move forward. So what I would recommend is go ahead and stop sharing and start over. Sometimes if you just stop it. Okay. 
let's go back and it's um it's not allowing me to do that so um do you want me to try does it allow is not allowing you to stop sharing okay here oh we wait go. oh there it is it just did now okay <laughs> technology you gotta okay. love it yeah so um i begin with this piece here because um it actually examines Haiti's most contentious social issues, um, such as colorism, identity crisis, objectification of women, gender inequality, and even the misuse of the French language. Uh, as you look at you know, the piece, the words in bold lettering provide an entry point to the painting. And they are printed on a canvas, which are aged with coffee, sewn and pasted on cardboard, to simulate a his historical past filled with contradictions. And in the foreground, um, the thin screen is torn, but repaired to sim symbolize Haitians' reluctance to seriously confront these issues. Um, and along the edges of the painting, I will actually wrote several subliminal and direct statements in Creole to further engage Haitians in a space where French will be likely spoken. And to further contextualize this painting, I've added uh, one of the audio recordings from a Haitian woman who had agreed to provide a perspective on objectification of women by Haitian men. Uh, take a listen. Hold on. The question okay, is, what do you go. think about the objectification of women by Haitian males? Um, the way that I understand objectification is basically degrading a woman to the status of an object, meaning not having respect for her, not treating her as an equal, not treating her um, as a human being who deserves respect, um, just like a man would treat another man. Uh, I think is, in my personal opinion, I think that it is a result of the culture. Haitian culture is a very uh, chauvinistic culture. It's a very, um, um, it's a culture with a lot of machismo. Um, it comes from religion. It comes from social practices. It comes from the way the boys are raised and the way the women are raised or the girls are raised later on when they become men and women. Um, then that I would say the result of those behaviors come come out the the behaviors that they learn as children. Um, I I think it's just sad and disgusting, but um, hopefully one day there will be some sort of equality and protection for women because men usually hold all of the resources in Haiti. Um, also, when they become violent or when they're misogynist, there's really no uh, legal recourse for women. And sometimes there's a lot of uh, patterns of abuse and sometimes there's just no recourse. Either the women suck it up or they move on if they can move on. Um, and that can, I think that abuse is, or that objectification um, is reflected in many different situations. For example, if you're walking down the street and you have like something very uh, flattering or form-fitting and you look good, then men think it's, a, it's okay. Uh, and they have permission to say whatever they want to say to you. If you're at a concert, you're dancing, you're at a bal, you're dancing, you're calling me, then some idiot can think that it's okay for him to come up behind you and start grinding on you, etc. Um, and sometimes, sadly, we hear too often that male um, partners would raise their hands at their female part on their female partners. Um, and also, men are expected to lead and to have control and to be the head of the house, the head of the family, etc. And women are supposed to be there to support them and be behind them, all that good stuff that comes from religion and just general practices. But that's just what I've seen in my experience. I also think that there are a lot of men and women in Haiti that do not objectify women and think of um, gender equality. And uh, I need to, I must add that um, uh, this is uh, in English, it's, it's one of the uh, recordings that I, but also had recordings from uh, individuals from uh, who actually live in Haiti. Um, they have uh, their own perspective on this, but I choose to use this one because we do have 
uh, an audience uh, primarily uh, that speaks uh, English, uh, understand English. So, um, so the next one, and it's still pretty much you know, prevalent. It's something that, that we're still uh, uh, trying to, uh, I'm not sure you know, we can get rid of it completely, but I think you know, for the more awareness about it will simply make people understand better. Uh, how to behave, you know, as far as, you know, when, when it comes to women, you know, how to treat, you know, uh, women uh, in Haiti. Um, my next piece, uh, it's called Black is Simply Beautiful. Um, and it's, uh, you know, and when I conceived this really, and I was trying to bring further awareness about colorism in Haiti, uh, we do have a term um, something is called Mitlet uh, Cafe, which is a translate pour me milk in your coffee. It's a simply a way to say Latin uh, on the race. Um, and I wanted the viewer to go beyond the dark complexion represented by the whip uh, canvas painted black in the foreground to experience the wounded psyche of that individual. A wounded psyche really that is defined by the torn canvas sewn partly by a rusted steel wire. And again, for this piece here, I've included uh, a recording uh, for uh, a young woman uh, who had agreed uh, to also share her perspective. Please take, take a listen. The difference in skin color is definitely highlighted in Haiti in the Haitian culture, uh, where, uh, in my opinion, individual with lighter complexion, they uh, do have uh, more privileges. And um, sometimes with the social issue or social class there is in Haiti, sometimes they do associate lighter complexion with more money. And also, um, and <laughs> it's also from the media that influence where lighter, you know, with a smaller nose or long hair, lighter just look um, better. Uh, and there's also that even though they may be Haitian, there's also that nickname where they would call them blanc, which blanc mean white. Uh, so the privileges, in my opinion, however, was instilled from um, slavery time when the mulatto were born from, you know, let's say a white master impregnated uh, a, a black sa slave and the child being born in a lighter complexion did get um, more privilege, whether it would be, you know, working in the house as opposed to on the field or something in that sort. So I believe that um, years after years, decades after decades, those privileges were passed down. Um, there is, like I said, that um, social class um, issue where there's you know, more advantage, people with more advantage compared to people with a lesser advantage where sometimes lesser advantage get mistreated or um, looked down upon. And um, it does, in my opinion, tie, tie in with the lighter um, complexion where sometimes um, uh, maybe they have, they are treated uh, a little better. And because there is that um, image too, that's very highlighted in the Haitian culture. Sometimes even jobs, um, better opportunities are offered to lighter complexions. I do see where um, they can, they, there's more privileges for, for them. Okay, and- um, It's very and it's, powerful. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's still a major, um, uh, issue in Haiti, and uh, because of our culture, uh, we uh, tend to uh, deflect instead of addressing or confronting, you know, those issues, and uh, and that's why you know I use uh, conceptualism 
because it, it provides you a certain neutrality to the subject matter. By the time you realize what it is, you've already engaged, you're engaged. And uh, it forces you and you don't have to really talk to anyone. Uh, it's pretty much, you know, uh, you and the painting. And it's, you can internalize it. And later on, if it's something you want to address, that's fine too. But the idea is to just, you know, bring, you know, more awareness um, about, you know, those, those issues in Haiti. Um, my next one is called National uh, Consciousness. Um, for this painting, I uh, used uh, a series of layers to depict the complexity, and again, and the state of Haiti's social construct due to colonialism. Um, the use of, you know, I use worn fabric, which basically signifies the fragility and uh, vulnerability of a society being exposed. And the cardboard is an indication of permanence for so long can eventually shift toward temporality. I also incorporated a large wooden brush in the middle uh, with missing steel bristles to symbolize the constant fight to rid Haiti of these social issues. Also on that brush, I inscribed in Creole, uh, we must come together as a unifying message uh, to overcome fear and despair. In addition, I use a small bell uh, on the uh, lower left, you know, uh, close to left corner here, as a signifier for a rallying call to a common cause. You know, and I'm trying to reach as many as possible. And, and I'm hoping, you know, uh, when, once the pandemic is over, uh, I can begin really to, uh, uh, to bring, you know, and to show this, showcase these uh, works and, you know, in communities where you know, uh, Haitians, you know, uh, demo Haitian demographic, it's uh, prevalent. So that's the goal for this year. Hopefully, I'll keep my fingers crossed. So, Eve, these were created in the last year. Uh, this, uh, this, I think uh, this piece here was two thousand and nineteen. I see. A couple of years ago. Yeah, like I said, it's an ongoing. You know, although I do, um, you know, do work on local issues or uh, issues you know, pertaining to the uh, you know, African uh, American community and people of color. But I also continue with that series because the more I learn, not, not only about the culture itself, but also about myself. Um, and that fear you know, has begun to dissipate. And because of the paintings now, I'm more vocal. You know, and, and, and now I'm allowing myself really to to talk about it and invite others now to share their stories. And, uh, and it's beginning to pay off. Now in this, in your other works, I noticed you have writing in this work. I do not, is there writing in this work? I can't tell. Yes, on the, on the brush. There is, okay. And there's, it's, it's written in Creole. And, okay. and there's, there's a reason for that because I want, because of, of the way you know we perceive you know Creole, where 100 percent of Haitians you know, actually speak it, uh, although you know we've seen a shift you know lately because now we have two national languages, but they're still lingering. That you, French you know is being used as a way to really denigrate you know those who can't speak it. You know while you know 100 percent of us actually speak that language, uh, and that should be sort of a, a, a historical past to that. You know how you that language came to being. I think, you know, we should be prideful, but because of colonialism and then we're seeing, you know, the adverse of that. So yeah, to, to answer your question, yes, there is, there is some writing. I love that. this work. Thank you. Um, the, the next one really, and I call it, and the title really is in Creole, Est-ce que ou um, Do you see me? And for this painting, really, uh, what he does is depicts, you know, Haitian, I mean, Haiti's current political uh, discourse as the marginalized, you know, demands are failing on deaf ears of the political class. Um, you know, the brown paper sewn onto the canvas with blue and red yarn represent the elite and middle class inability to empathize with their plight. And the spotlight 
is not meant to recognize the marginalized you know, invisibility, but rather to bring awareness to the mischaracterization of their intentions when they seek you know, better living condition through peaceful means. Uh, you know, we're seeing right now in Haiti, uh, you know, there's chaos. People, you know, tend to always believe that's coming from the marginalized, uh, but it's not so, really. So, um, and I think, you know, what this painting does is uh, it affords people now to learn more about, you know, what's going on in Haiti. Um, to see the marginalized, you know, I mean, for years, it's always been, you know, like this. And nothing, you know, has, hasn't changed much. And, and hopefully with this painting here, we get to see, you know, those uh, in a different light, you know, and uh, bring some respite, you know, to their plight because it's been a long overdue. Um, my next series really has to do, um, oops, I'm locked thing again, so I'm gonna try. Give it a second. Okay. So um, I had you use a lot of symbolism in your work. I noticed is are you um, do you feel like the symbols that you're creating in your work are universal? Or are they just personal symbols to you? They are personal uh, to me um, because you know a, a way to look like you know if you look at the brush, although I had used it for the pieces. Um, you know, it, it, it's a way to, to show how difficult it is. And, and I intentionally, you know, use uh, the wooden brush, you know, with uh, steel bristles because um, it's a lot harder. Um, although, you know, I mean, you can use it, you know, to scrub, but there's also those to scrub, you know, harder, something that is hard to, uh, uh, to remove, you know, in, instead of a, a, a vinyl or something else. So, it's, that's why, you know, I use this here. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, they can be uh, used, you know, for other uh, issues that are similar or to what, because this is um, not really a constraint, you know, to Haiti. Uh, and we're seeing it now in our community here, okay, and, and abroad as well. So, yes, I wouldn't say, you know, but for this particular uh, piece here, yes. And I intentionally, you know, use it, you know, to bring about, you know, uh, what's going on in here. Do you feel that colorism is applicable here in the United States to the Haiti community, or is it just in Haiti? Is there a difference in your opinion, or it's the same? Uh, it's pretty much it's cross cultural. And as a matter of fact, when I had this uh, my last exhibition, like you mentioned, shattered. And I had, uh, you know, from people from the uh, Hispanic community, uh, Asian um, uh, community. And um, not that I, I was surprised, but, you know, as they began to look at the pieces and say, my God, this is happening in my community. Uh, it may have a different feel, a different take, but it is there. And I don't think, you know, there is a, a difference between, you know, how we perceive, you know, people uh, of, of, of color of different uh, complexions uh, within our, uh, or communities. And we see also as well, you know, in the African community. So um, I'm not uh, talking, you know, when I make, you know, I'm the piece that deals with colorism, I think, you know, I'm including, you know, all those communities, uh, you know, the black and also community, African-American communities, as well as the, uh, the people of colors. Um, because, you know, they, we're all wrestling with, you know, colonization, uh, colonialism. And it, it's something that uh, we're seeing now more and more and more out in the open, and I'm happy to see that now. It's a very important topic, and it brings to mind, um, I know that um, the new film In the Heights with Lynn manuel that was a, a little bit of controversy, mm -hmm. that he did not have people of a darker complexion. And I mean, he apologized and I do, I do think it's something that we need to talk about. And that's what I really enjoy about your work is that you are bringing up very difficult topics that people don't want to talk about, but if we don't talk about it, we can't ever resolve these issues. Right. We don't, we, they're kind of like they're under the rug, but they're still there. Yeah. And I think, you know, we need, we need to focus on our communities. Uh, and I'm glad, you know, they call, 
to call you know, them out. Uh, because that's something you know, we've always um, held you know, the white community, right? Uh, you know, accountable for the like even Hollywood, uh, di- you know, lack of diversity. And now, now we have an opportunity, okay, to change that. And pretty much, you know, we are doing the same thing. And I'm glad now, and that's why now we in a different time where people now, they're just not being uh, uh, silent anymore. So when something happens, it doesn't matter where it's coming from, whether it's with, you know, within our community or elsewhere. And I'm glad now, you know, we have a voice now. People, you know, do use their agency now to call it out when it's there, wherever it may be coming, coming from. It's so important. Yeah, I agree. Do you, let's see if we can get you to move forward. If you want to try, maybe try to stop sharing again. Okay, let me. Let's see that. that seemed to work last time. Um, if you, it's, it's not letting you do a stop share. No, it's because, oh, here oh we go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. Okay. Um, okay, good. Uh, I mean, for this series here, um, one evening I was listening, uh, watching Don Lemon. Okay. Uh, sometimes, you know, I do, uh, you know, watch, um, his show and, um, and that he indicated that 47% of black LGBTQ youth were homeless. Oh my God. And this statistic really hit me. I mean, really hit me. Awful. Although, you know, my person, I've worked really, I manage a homeless shelter, you know, but they were for adults. So I never had the opportunity really to see younger people, okay, being in that situation. And, um, and that statistic really um, led me to you know, create this series and it's three paintings, you know, and I learned quite a bit since then and I'm still learning uh, about it. And, and I'm still really shocked, you know, uh, for what's happening, okay, to our youth, you know, out there. And because of, you know, uh, difference in, you know, the way they, they see themselves, you know, it's, it's un- unimaginable. So what I did with this painting, I simply tried to examine the painful process of the LGBTQ youth coming out of their parents, okay, homes or communities. Um, if you look at, you know, in the, the foreground, which is the bag itself, represents the individuals uh, along with their internal and external struggles. While the bob wire, I don't know if you can see it, exiting from it, from the bag, signifies the painful consequences for revealing the identity. The duct tape that I use uh, simply to secure the bag in the uh, foreground is to show the weakening of the familial or community bond once they choose to come out. Nonetheless, the use of cardboard between the foreground, if you're looking at it, there's the cardboard between the foreground and the background is indicative that things can change. Policies, you know, to harm these young people can actually be reversed. Fear from the communities can be replaced with understanding. And that was the other purpose, you know, for this, uh, the first painting. You know, um, the second one, oh, great, it works. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This one here simply examines um, some of the stages these young individuals experience during that process. I use um, four quadrants in various materials to capture these stages. And uh, what I did here as well, I forewent the traditional way of looking at things because usually we're looking at from things from left to right. So what I, what I did in this piece here I intently chose to begin from the upper right, followed by the bottom right, then the bottom left, and finally the upper left, to simply instigate the pause needed to reflect on each quadrant. Now, let's begin with the uh, the first uh, quadrant here. Um, Simply reflects on conformity. Um, You know, the broken spore on top, the cut wires are indicative of 
a reluctance on the part of parents uh, to accept you know, their children with their, that identity. And um, these you know, young men and women, often they leave due to mental abuse or they're asked to leave for refusing to conform to their parents' demands. You know, and we see this happening you know, more than we like to. But also use the brush with steel bristles. And we were talking about that brush, right? It's a smaller brush. As a signifier to the conformity often imposed by those parents as conditions. Now for the second quadrant going down, um, with the young represents the vulnerability and exploitation of their bodies to survive once they are homeless. And the third one as a combination of yarn and some steel wire to depict their res uh, resilience while they are figuring out ways to survive on and off the streets. And the last one, if you, you know, look at it closely, actually has thinner wires, but they're tight enough to create a net representing the much needed support from organizations to help with their homelessness. So I, I, want, I just wanted to you know, present you know, the process of each of those children, you know, I mean, those youth that are children, you know, they go through, you know, and I want people to basically, as they view this, to imagine, you know, I mean, you cannot walk in their shoes. I mean, we can never walk in their shoes, but we can imagine, okay, what their lives are. And, and hopefully this will be enough, okay, to inch away from the way, you know, those communities feel about, you know, those youth. You can imagine it must be terrifying. Yes. In that situation. Yeah. Because I've seen it happen to adults, you know, when they come to the shelter and how they are so vulnerable, you know, isolated, you know, due to addiction and, you know, other, you know, like mental health issues. And just imagine those young individuals, you know, no experience relying on their, their communities, their parents, okay, uh, to, to help them forge their way and now they're being, you know, abandoned because they decide, you know, to just share their identity, you know? It's not something that's being forced upon them. That's something that, that's who they are. Mm -hmm. And yet that lack of comprehension, understanding from our communities really, uh, to me, is despicable. Okay, um, the third one, which I call, uh, don't fence me out. Uh -oh. Again, okay, let's see, let's try to, if you try to do the um, stop. Stop sharing again. Yeah. Okay. Seems like it'd be a, there's a glitch in the system, it seems. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, the third painting here that you, you, you're looking, looking at really from that series, you know, I called it, the title, you know, Don't Fence Me Out. It's um, specifically aimed at the black and brown communities. You know, I chose to use large, bold, and red lettering to express the urgency this matter requires for members of these communities, you know, including religious leaders and politicians as well. You know, I uh, inverted, you know, the letters to project a specific crowd that is looking out, but it's given deaf ears to the plight of these young individuals. Once again, I use cardboard and other similar uh, materials, rejecting permanence as a solution to these dire social issues. I truly believe that, you know, we, we can, you know, if, if we take a moment to just, you know, look, you know, and feel the plight, you know, of those individuals, uh, for those who are, you know, in places where they can truly make a difference. And that's why, you know, I'm calling on them. And I'm begging them, okay, to reconsider, because you know um, those young, you know, um, men and women, they do deserve better, and it, we need to bring them home. Well, your work is right on point because we know right now, and it has been that the LGBTQ plus community has, 
you know, they're trying to take away, you know, bathroom rights. And there's like all these, you know, these, some of these states are trying to pass legislation um, to make it harder for these individuals to have a normal life. So. Yeah, even here in our state. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And, uh, and I will continue to um, exhibit, you know, whenever I can. Um, and, and, and I'm grateful that you've given me this platform, really, uh, to talk about it, not only for what's happening in Haiti, uh, you know, but also what's happening here uh, in the U.S. So thank you once again. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, uh, the next one really, and I call, I title it Elephant in the Room. It's also a series here, but I choose to show you this one. Yeah, um, I conceived this painting uh, as in really informational piece, you know, for those having a hard time uh, addressing this intricate part of the American history, specifically um, white individuals. Uh, they, they have a hard time really talking about this. And I thought, you know, having more, it's not whimsical, but uh, it's not really in your face, uh, but rather uh, it gives you uh, an insight as you begin really to interact with the piece now and you see uh, there's more to it, okay? And the wood uh, symbolizes the wooden ships, you know, they use, of course, to transport the enslaved uh, to um, America. And the letters, which um, have a series of words okay, connected to slavery. And if you, you know, look at closely each letter, okay, they do, you know, I purposely, you know, attach uh, a se series of uh, words, even for L, I will use lynching. So as people, you know, try to uh, now, it's more of a, a puzzle, try to figure out what those words, you know, when you put them together, what, uh, what they mean. Um, so I added those things really to further contextualize, you know, uh, and connect, you know, its savagery and inhuman treatments of whites, you know, towards, you know, the enslaved. And, 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 and during, you know, that, that the other shadowed exhibit, and I've seen it uh, really, and once it gets home, um, you know, people, and I've seen, you know, people come out, you know, in tears. Um, and, and for the canvas, you know, painted with acrylic paint and dirt actually signifies the land uh, on which, you know, they were forced, you know, those enslaved, you know, they were forced, you know, to work for free. And uh, the symbols were the ones used by the enslaved. And if you look at throughout uh, uh, the composition, you can have see those uh, symbols. Uh, they were used by the enslaved during their journey to freedom, you know, and the thread represents the Underground Railroad used by Harriet Tubman to lead you know, the enslaved you know, to freedom. So that's what this piece you know, is about. Um, and lastly, oh, it works. Okay, it's called you know, Uncontainable Tears. And, and I uh, you know, asked you know, the audience because I took you know, the time to simply, this is you know, from one of the uh, uh, the mothers uh, whose sons, you know, uh, was murdered. Uh, I believe that was in 2016. Um, and I, I just want, you know, the viewers, you know, to take your time, you know, to read this, okay? Um, just take a, take a moment, uh, just probably a minute, uh, just to read, um, you know, her statement here. And I think, I, which I, I believe, you know, it's extremely- Can you read that to us? I'm sorry, it's a little hard for us to read. Okay. Um, Can you read it? Sure. Uh, she says, uh, let me see. Uh, let me take a look here. Because I got to get closer to it. Yeah. I said, first thing you do when you get stopped by the police, you inform them that you have a weapon. If you have it on you, and comply. I'm having goosebumps. Uh, whatever they ask you to do, do it. Comply, comply, comply. That was my main issue because you stand a better chance of coming out alive 
rather than getting shot and not complying. So what is the difference in complying? And you get killed anyway. And that was uh, Valerie Castile. Yes. And that, that to me, <laughs> um, gosh. Powerful, very I'm, powerful I'm work. Still, I'm still, I don't know. Whenever I look at this piece and, and it's still growing, um, but let me just go over, you know, some just to, just take a moment here. Okay. Uh, this painting actually encapsulates the pain and suffering the black community and other communities of colors continue to endure on a consistent basis to do police brutality and institutional racism. While, you know, I provide, you know, providing context to statements made by one of the mother's victims that you have seen here, law enforcement personnel and prominent officials there. That's, you know, those are the, you know, the things that I have now. But now this is, that was, I believe, you know, when I did this and I took that photograph. Uh, now this painting is filled, you know, with, with statements. Uh, and the shattered container here signifies actually the tears and the brokenness of these individuals over the senseless murder of their loved ones. Uh, you know, Colette, I never thought that this piece uh, will become uh, somewhat a living document. <laughs> As we witness, you know, more black men and women die at the hands of the police since this is you know, an inception. You know, once, you know, I created this painting here and, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm looking at here and I still have a few more to add. I probably went out of space. I hope not. I do hope not. And I, and, and I hope that, you know, we'll bring, you know, the changes that we need really um, to stop, stop this. this yeah, so it's really, um, it's very sad that your, your practice has to bring attention to this horrible um, brutality that we're, we currently live in and, and our history, you know, it's, um, I'm glad that you are, because we need artists to do it more, I believe. Thank so, you. yeah, I think it's really extremely important. Um, can you, I mean, your work is so political and it's very social justice oriented. Has it always been like this or has it evolved or what did you, what, what, when you were in grad school, what were you doing then and how did it evolve? In, in grad school, I was really focusing on, you know, those issues in Haiti, you know, what's happening, because I was learning a great deal about myself as well. There was, you know, that constant fear, you know, because you're not part of a, of a culture and try to exonerate yourself completely. And as if, you know, you've never really, uh, and probably, you know, I never objectify a woman, but was I in a company of someone who did? Of course, he was part of the culture. And that's, that's something that I had to wrestle with, you know? You know, I had to be a participant. I had to be an observer. You know, I had to be the observed. And, and that's what, you know, I am, I'm so grateful now because some of uh, now the memories and, you know, I'm beginning now to remember a lot of things because you tend to suppress, you know, the good and the bad. The bad. And now that I've met, you know, with some friends now, uh, childhood friends, and we're reminiscing over some of this stuff, you know, and some of the things I said, you know, I don't know where you're getting these things from, you know, but as I force myself now to remember, and now I'm seeing it and, and, and I'm happy now and I'm a much better human being in doing so. And that's being here and I couldn't really, just to answer your question here, I, I'm part of the black community, okay? <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an artist. And I couldn't just ignore what was happening. Okay, it's my responsibility. Okay, whatever I can do now to bring it, okay, to whatever community there is. Okay, because when I exhibit my work, it's not just, you know, for Haitian community. It's not just, you know, for the African community. Okay, it's for everyone. And I think, you know, and I truly believe that's the only way that, you know, will come, you know, to a better space where everyone can actually uh, look at themselves internalize 
because you know, that's something you know we don't want to do and it's hard for us to do but we need we need to force you know ourselves okay to take a deeper look who we really are okay where do we stand okay on that spectrum and what can we do now to advance you know those causes and i don't know if that answers your questions but no it does you know you know i um I, I work as a docent at Perez Art Museum Miami, and um, mm -hmm. you, there's a um, a lot of art that, like, similar to your art, that and I'm very grateful for, so that I can bring up these hard topics to talk about racism and colorism and slavery and other social injustices, you know, wealth injustice and student debt, and I mean, there's God, there's so many issues we can talk about, right? And I think art gives you that opportunity that, that it opens a door and it's uncomfortable as a white woman for me to be talking to people sometimes about slavery or racism, but it does open the door to start the conversation. And I think it's so important. And I think that's what, in my humble opinion, art should do. You know, I, it's nice to have really pretty things as well. Um, but I really think real art has got to have a deep message. And I, that's why I really respect your art and um, love what you're doing. You have that voice and you're using it. Thank you. you know, it's really important. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you all next week. We have uh, Orlando Estrada with us next week. So I hope to see you all then. Have a good, good week. Bye, everybody. Thank you, you again, Eves. My pleasure. Fantastic. Thank okay, you. Bye bye. Bye.